when last we left our unfortunate protagonists in St. Jude's Centre of Troubled Youths, they were presented with the opportunities for violence and potential redemption, retribution, justice, the possibility of a way out. Some were given the chance of escape. Some were given the chance of committing an act of bloodshed to bring the entire structure down. In our last session, Emily fell short of completing the deed while she did stab one of her fellow inmates. She did not take her life. However, Damien was presented with that opportunity, was certainly goaded into it by a friendly, if friendly is the right word, voice through the radio claiming to be that of an angel. And meanwhile, Tobin has been given many an opportunity now, many a temptation to scale the outer wall of St. Jude's and make a flight to freedom with the girl he's taken a fancy to, Lana. And so we're going to join our crew late at night now. It's gone midnight. Everyone is sleeping. Everyone but you. Tobin. You feel a hand shaking you awake. I start making noises and quickly... Shh. Shut the fuck up. I'm, I'm not allowed to be in here, am I? And it's Lana. What are you doing here? Well, now's the time. Oh, oh, I... I start getting out of bed. I've uh, kept my clothes on. Uh, at least my trousers. It's, it's a bit harder to hide the rest. And I quickly get uh, my T-shirt on. And my uh, little silvery necklace jingles slightly as I throw it over my head. All right, you got the rest, everyone else? No, it's just got to be you and me. I decided, I had to think about it. I thought, should we bring anyone up? Anyway, I'll tell you when we're on the roof. Uh, all right. Uh, and I follow after her, trying to be as quiet as possible. It's difficult. The floorboards do creak something hellish in this place. After all, it's hardly in a state of fine repair. But thankfully... There's no sign of flashlights peering around corners. There's no sounds of people waking and wondering what that noise is. You can make your way up to the hole that led to the scaffolding before. And as you're going, she's starting to speak to you a little more readily. So what about you? Aren't you bringing anybody? Well, I... Uh, yeah, I, I, I told a few people to... To be there... Well, there's no uh, time for that now, is there? No, but I thought... Well, it's going to... I try to look at my... At the time, but I realise I don't have anything to keep measure of time anymore. Uh, I, don't, I don't even know what, what time it is. Look, I, it's a bit earlier than you were planning. Um, it, we, need to get, we need to get out now. Okay? Yeah, but... but but how? We, we, I thought we needed people to step on. I was doing some looking around the building site tonight before I went to bed. They've got a ladder, you know, one of those ones you can slide to make it longer. Yeah. I saw what I found one underneath a canvas. I think we can use that and just, you know. <gasps> oh, that's that's perfect. So, yeah, we don't need anybody else, Tobin. It could just be you and me now, okay? I hesitate a bit because somewhere in my mind I thought I thought she didn't really care about me and that, you know, she might just use me as a stepping stone as well to get out. But if she's found a ladder and she, she doesn't really need me, then what is this? I think to myself as I trot along. And you get to the rooftop, and the ladder is already there, laying upon it. Wow. 
Wow. Now, I, I yeah, I was a bit busy because. Well, I suppose, I suppose we can speak normally now. There's no one else out here. Uh, Something happened. Yeah, I guess you could say that. I, I there was a bit of a panic in the girls' dorm tonight. Um. Benita apparently got shivved by one of the other girls. She wouldn't say who, and in the end, the prefect, prefect insisted she go to see Dr. Crow, because Dr. Crow is the infirmary, I guess. And when I saw that, I mean, yeah, kids have been disappearing occasionally, but I just reckoned they were being... They were getting to go home or whatever, you know, I'm not... Yeah, and Benita, she... She didn't even seem like one of the, you know, some of the one that would would get attacked. I mean, she always kept to the back, kind of. Well, that's my that's my thinking. That's my thinking. You know, if anyone here can get stabbed, and you can see at this point, Lana's clearly a bit skittish. She's looking left and right. She's a bit twitchy. I, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. I am not staying one more day in a place where. Kids are just going to get stabbed, and yeah, no way. So I, as soon as uh, they called for lights out, ten minutes later, I made an excuse, went to the bathroom, came up here, started looking around for something, anything that could get me off the roof, and found the ladder. I could have could have got out without you, but I remembered you have been so kind to me, and. Well, it's, it's irresponsible, isn't it? Climbing up and down a ladder without someone to hold it as well. Um, I, I kind of, uh, I just look at her and uh, I try to catch her eye and I try to nod and I try to act calm, trying to be a, a sort of a presence uh, to to ease her down, even though I'm not really sure what I'm going to say. Let's do it. All right. Let's do it together then. Look, um... Tobin, just in case everything gets fucked up somehow. I know there's, you know, security on the gate and all that. I don't even know if this ladder's long enough. Uh, I'm a bit screwed up, and I think that's pretty obvious. I've I've done some really stupid things before, and I just wanted to say thanks because... You know, I know you're a guy and you're probably just um, just trying to be a white knight and all that, but <clears throat> I, I just wanted to say thank you. Don't let it go to your head or anything. It's just... Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be anyone, you know, Alana. I just... I thought we... You know, I, I kind of liked you from the start. All right, yeah, yeah, well, you know, we can talk about that once we're out, okay? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, All right, so let, let's um, get this ladder down over the edge of the building, then. Yeah. And I uh, go over and I try to figure out how to do this the quietest possible way without it going down with a crash. As with all these steel ladders, there's a certain element of squeaking and creaking and grinding of metal on metal as you ease one part away from the other, and it's especially loud tonight outside where you can't even hear traffic from the city around you. This is the only sound nearby, and she is wincing while she's looking at you. Hmm. Me too. But I'm trying to keep cool. Could you make a coolness roll, please? Eleven. You're able to slide the ladder apart without making much more noise. She gives you a quick thumbs up and gestures you over gestures you over to the far wall, the opposite side of the building to the main entrance says 
All right, let's lower it down here then. Uh, so obviously first first mission, get off the building, and then next, get up the wall on the other side of the courtyard. Yeah. Let's hope they're there as well. Right. Uh, well, we, I told them there to be somewhere around, so, you know, they shouldn't be far. Okay. And we may have to hide in some bushes for a while because they're not expecting us yet, but, you know. Yeah. Obviously, sure. if, you're, if your friends come up here thinking you're going to be here in a couple of hours and our, my friends haven't picked me up yet, so picked us up yet, then they might tell security or something like that. But let, let's, let, there's not much we can do about that right now, is there? No, let's, let's, let's do it now and, and just get out of here. And, and if we need to, we, we'll call your friend and, and say where we are. Just get far away okay. if we can. Okay. Yeah. And you lower the ladder down the edge of the building and find it dangles about six feet too short. You could slide it down the wall a ways so that the feet touch the ground. Yeah. Of course, that does mean that there's going to be a six-foot drop from the edge of the roof to the top of the ladder. And there's no one down there holding it for you. Yeah. Um... There aren't really many other options, unless you intend to climb down the building some other method. Yeah. The other way would be to kind of hang down from a drain pipe or something and settle it down. Yeah. But I'm a bit heavy and I don't trust that I would be able to hang like that. You can give it a try. Lana isn't built for that either. She's very slight, but uh, she probably wouldn't be able to support the ladder and slide down a drain pipe. I just see this and I think to myself, shit, if I drop it, it might fall either way. If I don't put it down properly, I'm going to have to try and and climb a bit down while she holds it and then lower it uh, on the nearest drain pipe. Okay. Okay, it all rests on this. I better, I better, better make it. Come on, Tobin. Okay, then. So tell me exactly what you're doing. I'm letting her hold on to the ladder uh, while I cl- start climbing down a drain pipe until I've found myself in a position maybe by a window or by something else where I could gain some extra purchase with my feet and then uh, take the ladder from her and lower it so that it just rests quietly against the wall and then I'll climb down on it or I'll, yeah, and, and steady it so she can drop down on it. It's a big ask, but let's see whether you can do it. Could you make a reflexes roll, please? Eight. You start shimmying down the drain pipe and it feels like it's going to hold. It feels that way at first. You find yourself inching by a window, which, judging by its position in the building, you don't think anyone occupies this room, but then you see a shadow move past the window. Just a blur of motion. And it's enough to make you shift suddenly because you don't want to be seen. And as you shift suddenly, the drain pipe shifts with you. There's a kind of pop as one of the rivets flies out the wall, and then a crack as the plastic of the drain pipe, now unsupported, struggles to maintain your weight on it. She looks down at you and starts feeding the ladder towards you, and you're kind of dangling there with one arm I feel my fingers are losing their grip, Uh, the ladder is coming down, I try to uh, grab it with the other arm and to move it downwards and and just make it hit the ground so I can again lean against it another reflexes roll please, as you feel the drain pipe, all thin plastic, just giving way, you hear it crack and splinter beneath you and it's like ice as you hear the crack go down the length of the drain pipe toward the ground seven holding onto the ladder doesn't help you 
In fact, quite the contrary. In this case, Lana, who is unaware of your situation, she's probably heard the plastic pop and creak, but knows little other than that, pushes the ladder towards you. You grab hold with one hand. The drain pipe comes free. All of a sudden, you are holding on only to the ladder, and Lana is the only person supporting you. She cannot support you. She is not strong enough to support you. I'm going to make a roll for a change as a GM to see how well she manages it. And on a five, that is not very well. You find yourself falling... But worse than that, you find yourself falling attached to a heavy steel ladder, which is only going to land underneath you or on top of you. You fall by a window, and as you do so, you're fairly certain you see Dr. Crow in there. It's only for a split second, but she seems to be looking at you, seems to be perfectly aware of what you're doing and just smiling as you go past. And then you crunch to the floor and then the ladder crashes on top of your prone body could you make a fortitude roll for me please 13 13 it is fair to say that in this case you have taken two serious wounds one to your back probably in the case that a couple of ribs have popped free. One to your leg, which has been pinned underneath a heavy steel ladder, just crashing straight down on it, landing on your knee. You are free from St. Jude's. You're outside. But with a deafening crash, with a couple of horrible injuries, thankfully no bone is protruding from your trousers, but you are in an immense pain. And you briefly see Lana's head disappear over the edge of the roof. And she's gone. Now we're going to go back to the other two. Emily, you were there to witness everything Lana is talking about, of course, because you were the person that stabbed Benita when she wouldn't give you your monkey. She didn't have your monkey. She just wanted the pills that you had procured from Dr. Crow. You had returned to your dorm to find the dagger still on your bed somehow, despite the fact you had left it with Benita, and then you disposed of it in a bin. And then there was talk just running rampant around the dorm that Benita had been stabbed by someone, people were using words that you didn't necessarily understand, like shivved, and when she stumbled in, bloody, the prefect quickly turned her around and took her to Dr. Crow. The murmuring in the dorm following this isn't so much scared, although there is definitely an element of fear, as excited. And that's maybe what's most disturbing. There's a aura of nervous energy about the entire dormitory. The girls staying up for a while, sitting on their beds talking to each other. It's talking to each other. I wonder who the stabber could be. I wonder if there's a murderer on the loose around here. Oh, it's scary. It's like a ghost story, isn't it? It's exciting, isn't it? It turns me on a little bit. Oh, that's so nasty. That kind of thing. What are you doing? I I'm sitting on my bed and listening to what's going on. Emily is normally not known for to be a person that talks a lot and this is certainly the case right now. She is just sitting there listening to what people are saying, hoping that no one knows that it's her secretly. Eventually, your solitude comes to an end when the familiar and dangerous face of Aaliyah comes over to you. She's still dressed for the day in her prefect's garb. Emily? I don't suppose you would come with me. 
Now you've seen what Aaliyah is capable of. You haven't forgotten what she and the other prefects did to that girl. With the electrodes, with the battery. I don't want to come with you. Well, it's very much an order from the prefects because you've been a very bad girl. I haven't done anything. You've been a very bad girl, and you don't want all the rest of the girls here to hear about that, do you? I don't want to come with you. Am I going to have to drag you by the hair? Because I will. And I don't care how many of those precious little hairs I pull out. In fact, I quite like pulling them out. Emily has been looking down at her hands resting on the bed up until now when she lifts her head and and looks into the person standing in front of her eyes in a very matter of fact way almost a way that only children can ask not in an accusatory way but just in a way that almost like it comes from the most innocent place within Emily. She asks Why are you always so mean? Aaliyah's face drops for a moment. That fixed sadistic look just falters, quivers for a second. And as it does your perception of her changes as well. Just as you occasionally see people covered in insects or with the heads of insects you see bugs everywhere whenever you're stressed or feeling anxious. Her face changes but this is the first time you've seen a face change in this way because for a moment, just a moment it's like her eyes have been replaced by buttons, the kinds of buttons you have on one of your coats. And her mouth is replaced with a zip that just hangs open. And in the place of her nose, she has one of those toggles on one of your winter jackets. Ones your mother used to like dressing you up in before you before your problem got too uncontrollable. She looks like a doll as she stands there just rigid and doesn't respond. You look like a doll. It's time you came with me now. And her face is back to normal. It is time you came with me. Emily hesitates, but in the end she gets up. She knows that She can't do anything. She's too small to physically fight what's going on. And in some way, even if she knows that what's going to happen to her is potentially very dangerous, she almost feels like it's as if she deserves it for what she did to that other girl. Like... Whatever is coming her way is probably what's kind of meant to be. Aaliyah takes you down a corridor. You're joined by a couple of the other prefects. Georgina, you see. Uh, You also see Oscar, who keeps giving you sly smiles. Aaliyah says to you as she's taking you upstairs... Now, Emily, I think this is going to be a bit of a treat for you. We're not going to hurt you. We're not even taking you to Dr. Crow. We know what you did. We know exactly what you did. We think it's... We think... It's pretty impressive. It's bad. It's bad. It's bad. She said she had my monkey. I know. She lied, didn't she? She told me everything. When I was taking her to Dr. Crow, she told me everything. And I know exactly why you did it. I've been hurt before. I've been betrayed before. I've done the exact same thing as you. And so when I thought of why you did it, and her face is all of a sudden 
made of cloth and wool is poking out from behind one of her ears. When I thought of it, I thought, you're more like us than them. So we're going to take you to the memory hole. The memory hole? The memory hole? Haven't you heard of it? No, no. Oh, that we've been taking some kids to the memory hole since you got here, and they always come out... Well, different. <laughs> Most of them come out a bit better. A little more fun. Uh, I think you'll come out a lot more fun. I don't want to be like you. You mean? Well, you're going to come out a lot better, I think, than us. And you find yourself in that corridor, the same corridor that you were in, that led you to the hole in the wall, that led you to the city of cogs and gears where you lost your monkey. But she opens a door on the other side of the corridor. Come on, in here. This will be nice and quick. And I promise we won't hurt you. Cross my heart and hope to die. You gonna step in, or are we going to drag you in? Emily steps in. The room looks as bare and unfurnished as many of the others in this facility, bar one big difference. There is a gaping hole in the centre of the room, as if a heavy weight had just slammed through the floorboards and gone dum, 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 through to the ground floor, maybe below. Watch your footing. You don't want to fall down there. Do you die if you fall down there? I actually don't know, uh, but it's probably not a good idea to find out. Now, we're going to leave you alone in this room for a little while. Because What's going it, to happen? It just gives you time to think, Emily. Gives you time to think about whether you want to be a prefect like us. Because I think you would be perfect. I've seen all be... your I've seen all your little ways, the ways you do things, and she flicks some of her hair back. And again, briefly looks like a stuffed toy. I've seen the way you are, the way you twitch, the way you shuffle, the way you mutter, and, and of course your violent outbursts as well. And I think... I think having something like being a prefect would really set your life straight. Up until now, Emily hasn't really commented on the fact that... The person in front of her is seemingly changing all the time, morphing into clothing and dolls. Up until now, she's put it down to her own hallucinations, but she never, she's never hallucinated like this before. So she cocks her head to one side and looks up at her and says, Why do you look like clothes? That is... I tell you what, Emily, and she gets down to your level. So her face is level with yours, and her face in no way looks human. Now that you're up close to it, although it has the appearance of humanity, you can see lined upon her face, stitching, stitched sackcloth. And you can see inside her mouth, just behind her teeth when she talks, rough sandpaper-like fabric in the place of her tongue. And you can see that her hair, which looked braided, is in fact, well, a piece of string. But only when you're up close, but it doesn't go away at all now. After your time in the memory hole, I will tell you everything. I will tell you everything about what I am, what I became, and how you can 
become something different too. Emily looks down as she's being talked to. She doesn't like when anyone is that close to her, so she tends to retract. She doesn't step away though. She doesn't seem like she's intimidated. She fiddles her fingers in front of her and almost like a whisper she says I, w- I want to be a good prefect not a bad one well there's room for good prefects too I'm going to leave you in here now and Georgina, Oscar and I will wait outside and as a point of reference you've not seen Georgina or Oscar change but could you make a soul roll please nine As far as you can tell, they're not aware of anything that you're seeing of Aaliyah at this point. At least, they're not looking at her strangely in the same way you have been. They are just smiling or casual and, again, on the verge of excited, looking forward to the outcome of this trip to the memory hole. Anyway, we'll close the door. Why don't you knock on the door when you're finished, okay? That's what Dr. Crow likes. And they close the door. You're left alone in a room with a hole in the floor. A deep hole. There's nothing else in here. Just the door, the broken floorboards, and the hole. And a breeze that is emerging from the hole. It's warm. I'm going to step forward very slowly as I approach the hole. No idea what is going to be down there, so I'm very careful. I'm going to go to the edge of it and look down. You see a flash of light that knocks you backwards with a blast. And you're sat on your living room floor. Your parents are on the sofa. They're watching TV. You were on the floor playing with your toys. You're probably a few years younger. You have a toy monkey, but this is before you had your monkey specifically to prevent your self-harm. Emily, dear, what's wrong? You just had a... You just jumped. I call it someone walking over your grave, says your dad. Grave? I... I don't don't know. You okay, Emily? You look like you've seen a ghost. I call it someone walking over your grave, says your dad. At this point, Emily just looks around. No idea what's going on. Looks at her mom and her dad, trying to figure out what exactly is happening, if she's hallucinating or what is going on. She feels the floorboard beneath her to kind of figure out if if it feels like the floor at home or if it's different. It does feel like the floor at home. There's a rug just underneath the coffee table and you can touch it with your bare toes and you can feel the knotted fabric around the edge that certainly wasn't there in the memory hole room your parents haven't looked at you their eyes are still fixed on the TV screen Emily, get down you're in the way of the television sorry Emily ducks down and kind of crawls away on the floor and places herself in the corner of the room Aren't you going to play with your toys, Emily? They cost a lot of money. Um, um... I told you you spoil a girl. You can't spoil a child. I'm sorry. Emily reaches out for one of her toys, and... She does... She's not emerged in any kind of play. She's... Pretending like she's playing... And she's fixated on both her parents, trying to figure out what is happening. 
I've always been worried about you, Emily. You don't act like a normal girl would. And should. Well, if you keep worrying like that, you're going to make yourself ill. I know, it is making me ill. She makes me ill. At this point, your dad looks to your mother. She's making me ill as well, father. She's making me feel very ill indeed. Well, you know what they say. It's like someone walking over your grave. What? What does that mean? Why do you keep saying that, Dad? What I wonder is how she can be so selfish. We raised her to be generous, friendly. She had friends when she was in primary school. When she had, when she was at school from the ages of five until about nine or ten, I can't remember how old she was. I think she was ten. Maybe nine. She had friends. She was normal. She was a perfectly normal girl. And then, yes, then the trouble started. I don't know what it was, what 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 she did. What I mean, she must have done something to cause it, or someone did something to her. You've you've seen those documentaries. Something bad happens to a child, screws them up for life. Well, we did. It's not our fault. Why should we have to deal with it? Well, we are her parents, mother. Maybe so. But she is very selfish. She is selfish, I agree. I'm not selfish. At this point, your mother's head turns to you. And all of this has had a vaguely hallucinatory feel to it. Not the feel, the physical feeling. This has all been tangible. It's all been real. You can touch it with your fingers, with your toes, and... It feels like your home, but the hostility, the language, even at their worst, your parents were never just outright aggressive toward you. They were dismissive sometimes, a lot of the time. They were certainly ignorant. But your mother's head cranks towards you as if mechanized. It just tilts on her neck. And these words are words you remember. These words are words you remember sending you down a spiral of anxiety at a young age. And just stuck with you, made you feel guilt for a long, long time. You are a selfish girl, Emily. Because of all your problems, you're causing a great deal of pain to your father and I. The two of us are so ill. We're sick. We're sick of it. We are so sick. And it's your fault. You... Why why can't you just be better? Why can't you just be normal? Why is it that you have to cause so many problems for us? Because... We were happy. We were a happy family. Look at me when I'm talking to you, Emily. We were a happy family. We were a happy couple. People liked us. People invited us over to the houses. We had friends. And and since you started getting all, all fucked up, we've lost everything. And you just keep doing it. We keep telling you to get better. We keep taking you to therapists. We keep getting you on medication and nothing, nothing. And all it leads to is us becoming worse and worse. I didn't ask for this. I didn't. I didn't ask for this. If, If I... Emily has never reacted like this before. She's balding her fists and looking directly at her mom. She's never confronted her before, at least not in real life. If I could change, I would, but I can't. And you never loved me. Never! A mom is supposed to love her child, but you never did! It 
It's okay, Emily. And your gaze is drawn to the television. But Dr. Crow is sat looking at you from the screen. But her face is like that of a centipede as it was days ago when you saw her. Emily. It's okay. You are loved here at St. Jude's. You remember how awful your parents were to you. Emily nods. We can be your family now, Emily. And just because we're scary, just because we're mean sometimes, doesn't mean we're not a better family to you than your blood relations. Your mother and father failed you, and we won't fail you. I'm I'm having children all the time, Emily, and I would love for you to be one of mine. Will you be one of my children, Emily? It's, it's you. You, you're behind all this. You, you're controlling the prefects. Maybe you're controlling all the kids. No, they have free will, they choose, and her arms dissolve into a hill of fire ants that quickly scuttles away to the sides of this monitor and they start pouring out through the speaker. They choose to be this way because I remove everything, telling them that they shouldn't. all been treated horribly, Emily, just like you. And the fire ants make their way across the floor towards you. Take these bugs inside yourself and be like us. You have listened to an episode of Red Moon Roleplaying, where we played the scenario It Started and Ended with Screams for Cult Divinity Lost, from the upcoming Screams and Whispers scenario collection. The scenario was written by our friend Matthew Dawkins, who is also our Game Master. Joining Craig and Yalmer was the talented Clara Herbel. The music was made by Atrium Carceri and was used with permission from their label, Cryochamber. Check out their website at cryochamber.bandcamp.com or their YouTube channel for some moody, dark ambient. We would like to give massive thanks to our champions of the Red Moon, Martin Horshobear, Nastasha Rollerson, Simon Cooper, David, Julia, Camilla, and Ludwig Manford for their generous support. And we would of course also like to thank all of our other patrons. Without your support, the show would not be possible. If you want to support our work, please check us out on Patreon. You can get access to bonus campaigns for Cult of Indie Lost and Coriolis there, as well as get early and raw access to all of our recordings. You can also hear your name read on the show as a champion of the Red Moon, as well as play Cult with us. Most importantly, that support is what keeps the show going, so do check us out there. Thank you again for listening, and remember, death is only the beginning.